Okay, uh, we are looking at um, chapter 25. This is lecture one on chapter 25 uh, for managerial accounting. We're going to talk about capital investments. Um, there's kind of two major parts of this chapter. Um, there's the, um, the methods not using Sorry, I forgot to do this. Um, there's a method not using present values, and then the second video is a uh, method using present values. So it says page 1261 to 1266. Uh, we're going to talk about these different methods of calculation. Um, I've got two brief exercises and then an exercise. I might have to split this up to make the video a little shorter, but we'll see. Um, so for now, let's jump into it. So First thing we're talking about, when we talk about capital investment or capital budgeting, we're talking about management looking at different areas that they can put their money uh, within their business and seeing what's the best investment. So should I buy this piece of equipment or that piece of equipment? Should I expand this area of the business or a different area of the business? Should I, um, you know, where should I put the money that I have within my organization and what's going to return me the best amount? But there's not just one method to, to try and calculate that. Um, so the methods we're going to look at in this uh, chapter overall, we're going to look at the average rate of return method, the cash payback method, the net present value method, and the internal rate of return method. The first two methods do not use time value money, the average rate of return method and the cash back method. Um, the second two do. Um, so the first ones we're going to look at is, the first one we're going to look at is average rate of return. This is on page 1,263. Um, the average rate of return is also called the accounting rate of return measures the average income as a percentage of the average investment. So the average rate of return is computed as follows. We got the average annual income um, divided by the average investment. I want you to notice something. Some of these formulas use, invest or use income and some of them use cash flows. Those are not the same thing. Okay, income is exactly what it sounds like, revenues minus expenses. Whereas cash flows is also exactly what it sounds like, is actually money coming in versus money going out, actual cash. Okay, so do make sure and draw that, that line in the sand about the difference between the two. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna take um, the average income and divide it by the average investment. Now, the hard part sometimes is finding the average investment. The average income usually pretty, pretty easy um, to run an average, but we'll look at an example of that here in a second. But I'm just going to take you know the total and divide by the number of years to get an average. Um, all the revenues and expenses for the project, revenues minus expenses, I uh, will give my income and then find the average of that. Um, but a lot of times we're talking about investing in capital investments, and okay, sorry about that. So the average investment is the one that's a little tougher to do um, for most people. We do assume straight line depreciation. If you don't know what straight line depreciation is, um, you can Google it. But effectively, we're talking about equal uh, depreciation over the life of the uh, fixed asset. Um, so the formula for that, which again, you can easily find on the internet, but is um, cost minus residual value divided by its useful life. Um, so because of that, because that is our method and we do assume straight line for this entire chapter, we can find the average investment and we mean investment here as in what the amount of money that's being tied up by this project. Um, we can find the average investment by taking the initial cost of the investment plus the residual value uh, divided by two. Um, why is that? Because the initial cost is a cash outflow and then the residual value is a cash inflow at the end. So the average amount of cash tied up would be beginning value uh, plus the ending value divided by two for life. So, uh, for example, they give here in the chapter on page 1264, it says they got a new machine for $500,000, the residual value of zero, uh, expected income from the machine uh, is 200,000, expected total income is $200,000. Notice that says total, not average or annual. Um, so our average annual income is five is $50,000 a year, and all they did was take the 50, I'm sorry, the $200,000 worth of income divided by four years. Uh, to get $50,000 average income. Um, and then the average investment took the initial cost plus the residual value. So in this case, the residual value is zero. So 500,000 plus zero divided by two, which is 250,000. So effectively, um, our average rate of return is 20%. Now, if you look at this as you know what it is in the end, it kind of makes a little more sense sometimes in the computation. That is that I am investing an average of $250,000. I know it's $500,000, but really, um, 
you know, it's spread out over an equal amount of, of time because it's depreciated down to zero. Um, and so on the average, I'm getting 20% of that back every single year. $50,000 is 20% of $250,000. And we will do an exercise on that brief exercise 25-1 here in just a minute. Um, the next one that it talks about um, is cash payback period. Uh, cash, cash payback period is really simple. If it's equal cash flows, it gets a little more complicated if it's unequal cash flows throughout the life of the project. Um, so what the cash payback period does more than anything else is it measures your risk. Um, because the longer your payback period, the more risk. Uh, the longer any project extends in time, generally the higher amount of risk. Why? Because the longer time frame, the more unknowns. Uh, the example I like to give is, you know, do you know, although in this day and age for the pandemic, we don't really know as much, but generally speaking, you would know what you're going to be doing next week and maybe two weeks from now, maybe three weeks from now, but do you know what's going to be happening in the world or what you're going to be doing a year from now or two years from now? The answer is generally no. Um, that's just kind of a, a, a bare bones example of the fact that I know more earlier, I know more about the near future than I do the further future. Uh, therefore, the faster the payback period, the uh, faster I get my money back, uh, the lower the risk, overall risk of the investment is. Um, so the cash payback period, again, a pretty simple, form, pr pretty simple, straightforward formula. I take my initial cost divided by my annual net cash inflow. Notice this is cash inflow, not doesn't include, you know, it's not net income, so I'm not worried about expenses. I'm only talking about actual cash. So example they give on the bottom of 1264 and over on 1265, it says management is evaluating the purchase of the following equipment. Um, the cost of the new machine is $200,000. The revenues from the new machine per year, so that's not a total, it's a per year amount, is $50,000. The expenses uh, of the machine per year, including depreciation, is $20,000. Now, here's the issue there. Depreciation, while it's an expense, and it is counted when we talk about income, like we did on the prior uh, problem, uh, it is a non-cash expense and therefore is not included in my cash flow problems. So I want to remove that depreciation. So what that means is the total expenses are 30,000, but the depreciation, it, including depreciation is 30,000, 20,000 of that is depreciation. So effectively my cash expenses are only $10,000. Um, so that's what you see they do on the next page, 1265. They take the cash flows per year of 50,000. They take out 10,000, only 10,000 because I removed the depreciation. I only want the cash outflows for an average of $40,000. So I can then just take my initial cost um, divided by my annual cash inflow to figure out how long it takes to be paid back. In this case, that's five years. So I will get my money back. My money returns to me um, in exactly five years. Now, how do I do this if, I, if it is unequal? Um, I believe the one that we're looking at in the book is an unequal cash flows, if I remember right. Um, so we'll do an example of this one because it's a little more complicated. But effectively, all I really need to do is, um, or we'll look at one that's une unequal cash flows. All I need to do is I need to figure out the year that it pays back, and then I assume that it's e even cash flows throughout that year uh, that it pays back. And so I find the portion of the year needed, um, the, the decimal, the fraction of the year needed in order to finish that payback period. Um, okay, I think just to make my videos a little shorter, I'm going to stop this video here and then I'm going to do the two uh, examples here. I'm going to do the brief exercises and the exercise, these three, um, on the next video.